Oh, it's torture. It's about, I think it's about as torturous as you can get. I did altogether 26 years in prison. Uh, the first five years was spent going back, back and forth in the shoot. My longest term in there without break was 24 months. It was horrible to set a man inside a closed structure for years on end. Man, that's an atrocity, man. You're destroying, trying to destroy a human being. I was incarcerated for 18 years, and out of the 18 years, I spent about five years in solitary confinement. The treatment that I received there and what I witnessed of other people was just inhumane. I served nine years in the New York State prison system and was sent to solitary confinement. It's a, it's a horror movie. My son is in Pelican Bay State Prison. His total time in solitary confinement has been 14 years now. I told I was in solitary confinement for 29 years. I was in prison for a total of 31 years. I did a total of three years altogether um, in solitary with the longest stint being about 10 months straight. You have people dying in solitary. You have people committing suicide. You have people dying from heat in solitary. These are real issues that are happening right now, right here in our soil. It's not just happening, you know, in another country. This is happening right here, right now. People being tortured. People are allowing it to happen, not because they agree, but because they simply just don't know about it. Some form of isolation is used in all prisons. The administrative segregation, it's called the hole, it's called a lot of things. We are seeing that, that they've built these particular units for the sole purpose of solitary confinement in most states at this point. It started with the federal government and now it has expanded. The national figure that's mostly used is that there are 80,000 people in these units across the country. It's not just these units, it's also administrative segregation and psychiatric units of certain kinds and things they call behavior modification units. There's lots of different names for what is essentially still long-term isolation. I mean, whenever we've had prisons, there's been the use of lockdown, basically, in order to punish people for acts they've committed out in the prison system. So there's a certain amount of people in the shoe for disciplinary reasons. They're there for determinant sentences. In other words, a year, a year and a half, they're given a certain length of time for this punishment. But then there's another category, which is gang management. It doesn't have to be based on behavior at all. It's really assumed gang association. The people doing time in the shoe for gang affiliation are there indefinitely. It's been, the average length of stay is six years, and people have been there for 10, 20, up to 40 years. Well, if you focus on prison, you have to see solitary confinement and conversely. Um, yes, solitary confinement, you have to see prison, so the two are related. Well, solitary confinement uh, goes hand in hand with the rise of the tough on crime movement. Until 1970, we had a period of about 100 years when the stated goal of the correction system was rehabilitation. It didn't often do it very well, but that was at least the theme and the goal. Since then, prisons in large part have been known as places of punishment, warehousing, and the like. And one once you set up a system where punishment is the norm or the goal, then expanding the use of solitary confinement seems almost natural. We both have higher numbers of people in prison because of the lack of programming, huge amounts of disciplinary issues within the system, and then along comes solitary confinement, uh, supposedly as a response, as a solution to those problems. So for many people, it seems like a natural outgrowth of uh, what happens in mass incarceration. Incarceration in this country is unprecedented for this nation and for any nation. We have one quarter of the world's incarcerated people, even though we only have 5% of the world's population. This is unprecedented. This is a racialized system of social control that has followed a long line in this country from slavery to Jim Crow segregation to ghettoization to now incarceration. And solitary confinement is a manifestation of that. When we speak about incarceration, we're talking about people of color, let's be honest, right? Solitary people of color. Mass incarceration is an outgrowth 
of a whole myriad of issues and situations that are impacting society right now and that leads to mass incarceration. Racism is a major part of it. We don't like to use that term. And then when you start talking about solitary confinement, it is a corralling and a controlling in the most dehumanizing way possible. Me, as a white prisoner, um, I can go stab somebody or go kill a guard and I'll go to solitary confinement for a few years. But if, you know, Joe Smith, who's African American, uh, holds a secret ethnic studies class, he goes to solitary confinement forever. They have this process where they can place you in solitary confinement behind other prisoners um, making statements about you, but they would never identify those prisoners, so you had no due process to question them or, you know, prove their allegations wrong. They would use drawings, especially Aztec art. They would use books. Uh, the Soledad Brothers is a book that could have gotten you placed in shoe. You know, different things like this. You know, notes being found. It didn't have to be found in your possession. It could be in somebody else's possession. And, and there's no real way to get out once you're in that category in, except to do what's called debriefing, to become an informant. So, so you can um, meet with the officials and say, oh, well, I renounce my gang membership and, and to prove that I'm getting out, I'm gonna tell you who, who I know the bad actors are. And so you, be, you have to become an informant, which of course means risking your life, um, number one. But number two, all international law will tell you that this is coerced information, which is highly unreliable and, and yet it's used to keep people in these places with evidence that they can't confront because it's confidential information uh, for, for years and years. That means you come out and you need to tell or something, you, you, you fabricate stories on somebody else so you can stop the tor your own torture, but you uh, give up somebody else to start theirs. And so you actually become a cog in, the, uh, in that cruel system. Probably before I knew much about solitary confinement, I thought it must have been reserved for the worst of the worst. Unfortunately, that is not the case. People get uh, tickets, as they call them here in New York State, to solitary confinement for nonviolent infractions of prison discipline, for talking back, for having too many postage stamps, for wearing the wrong sweatshirt. I mean, the list goes on of very minor infractions of prison discipline that people can be put in solitary confinement for. This is Johnny. Okay, so I got a few minutes. What day you got caught? Did you come in Monday? Before I, I became a reentry advocate, and I guess one of the reasons why I am effective at my job here is because I served 13 years out of a 15-year census um, for robbery. I, I was sentenced at 21. I'm 35 now. But during that time, I managed to, you know, educate myself and try to, you know, elevate and better myself. So solitary is used as punishment. People are sent to prison as punishment, not for punishment. But it's, it's, it's used as a means of control of trying to modify people's behavior. Uh, the problem is, is that it doesn't necessarily work like that. Sometimes it just makes the behavior even worse. Um, because while you're in solitary, you're not receiving any type of treatment, you're not receiving any type of anger management, if that is the case, any drug treatment, if, if drugs use what's what got you in there. Um, and sometimes it's used actually in a retaliatory sense also, so you have officers, if you don't get along with the officer, you might find yourself you know, receiving a misbehavior report, some minor infraction, but it'll lead you to being um, placed in shoe for you know a, a, number, of, a number of time. The cell's very small. I'm six feet tall, so if I stretch my hands out, I can touch both walls. Sometimes it's very quiet. You know, you can hear your heartbeat sometimes. Um, sometimes it gets so loud, actually, from the other men screaming or kicking on their gates for, you know, a number of different reasons that you have to go to sleep to the sound of other people crying, yelling, screaming, you know, um, hurting themselves. And to be there, you're in a cell. So if you hear somebody talking, and imagine me and you're talking, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just so you can't really make out the words because it's such a distance, right? Now you quantify that times 200. 
and all you hear all day long is, you can't make it's like a puzzle you can never solve it's like you it's like right out of earshot you start hearing your own heartbeat i would lay in my bed and just squeeze like my whole body just to feel something yeah. squelching radios people screaming in their cells singing praying calling for their moms uh, some people just scream for hours on end just to hear something uh, some people scream and do things to get the officers to come and respond to them so they can have some human contact it's a uh, it's a horror movie. It echoes. It's very dark. It's gray. They always have it painted a dark color. So it looks like you're in a dungeon. And all you see is cells with bars. You have a metal bed, a metal sink, a metal toilet. If you're not in compliance, you will hear the guards beat the inmates. You will also hear rapes. Um, while I was incarcerated, um, which made things worse for me because I would hear my peers screaming at the top of their lungs. Sometimes I would go to the slot and look out the slot and you could see the shadows of the blows going and you could hear the screams. A lot of us would wonder where we next. It was hard. When I was young, I used to act out. My mom was in the room one time out. And then, you know, because she cared, an hour later she would come in and say, hey, what's wrong with you? Why didn't you do the dishes, right? Um, but we just sending people to their room on time out and say, okay, just, you know, go to your room, you're on time out, and I'll see you when you're 37, you'll figure it out yourself. Every person can be devastatingly harmed by solitary confinement. Whether you're young, you're old, you're middle-aged, whether you're a woman, a man, a transgender person, whether you have mental health issues before you go inside or not, whether you have disabilities or not, but some individuals face even additional harm either from the isolation itself or by being placed in isolation face additional abuse inside. Children are one group of people that that is true for. Brain research and science has long shown that people's brains continue to develop into your mid-20s if not beyond. And yet we continue to incarcerate young people, 16, 17 year olds, sometimes even younger. And then we also continue to place them in solitary confinement. Similarly, there are people who have pre-existing mental health issues who we know the use of solitary will be devastating for them. I worked on Rikers Island for 23 years. We call solitary confinement unit the Bing. And I remember going to one of the offices and saying, you know, why is why does everyone call this the Bing? And the officer said, well, what we think the reason is that for so many people, their minds go Bing after they're there for a while. So we, we began calling it the Bing. People do have mental breakdowns. They went into the Bing healthy. They came out mentally ill. It's a very sterile place that creates very um, sterile relationships, right? Where you don't really, you know, um, you talk to people, you mean like, you know, you do the saludos, hey, good morning, good afternoon, but never um, those deep, meaningful conversations where, you know, at least, at least for me, I, I went in there with a lot of trauma. Now, if someone is at all prone to mental disorder, to schizophrenia, to major depression, to bipolar disorder, what we know from a great deal of research literature is that they will have a breakdown of the type that they're inclined to have. So people who are schizophrenic will have a psychotic episode. People who are depressed will become very depressed, maybe suicidal. They're isolated from their neighbors, but they can shout. Their, their cell, there's no other cell in most situations facing them but there's a neighbor on each side and what they will do is shout. And therefore there's no private conversation because everybody on the pod can hear the shouting, but they can talk to each other. As the years go by, what the prisoners tell me is they stop talking to each other. They don't even shout out good morning to their neighbor. They don't talk to other prisoners as they walk to the recreation, which they're doing in shackles, but they could say hi to someone whose cell they pass. They don't. And they tell me there's just no use talking. We are, there's nothing happening. We already know 
what's going on with this person and nothing new has happened and we just isolate ourselves. Another of the symptoms that we find very widespread, just about universal, is mounting anger accompanied by a fear that the anger will get out of control and they'll get into more trouble. So what they do typically is to suppress their anger. They just sit on their anger. They don't allow themselves to express it. And as they do that, they start suppressing all other feelings. And over time, that gets, uh, it evolves to being basically numb. Some describe it as a state of being dumb, numb, dead, a zombie, and they just start losing touch with their feelings. There's been enough studies, there's been enough research, there's been enough data collected that there's evidence that this does affect the human mind, the brain, um, physically. I mean, they deprive natural sunlight, you know, everything, the hearing, the, the eyes, every part of your body, mental and physical. Only touch that you're feeling, you know, is a touch of aggression where officers are ushering you from one spot to another, uh, whether it be the shower, or out the court, or, or to the recreation yard after 23 hours of lockdown. Then you're back in there. The moral cost is we're damaging humans permanently. So every person we set in, never the same. Never the same. Some people probably, you know, feel that, you know, tortures, you know, agonizing and, and, you know, something that is, you know, uh, relates only to physical pain or something like that. But, you know, being isolated, you know, from yourself or being isolated from people uh, for a long extended period of time in itself uh, is torture. The definition of torture is in the Convention Against Torture, a treaty that has been signed by more than 145 countries and that is reflective of customary international law. It defines torture as a deliberate, intentional infliction of pain and suffering of a certain gravity done by a state agent for the purpose of interrogation or punishment or, or any other purpose. It's prohibited categorically and absolutely under any circumstance under international law. It is cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment when it is prolonged. Any period beyond 15 days is considered prolonged, and, it, and especially when it is indefinite. The fact that uh, you don't have long-term effects doesn't mean that you don't suffer. Just like you can overcome being waterboarded, and if you're sane after that and healthy, it doesn't mean that you haven't been tortured. The same with uh, solitary confinement. The fact that you cope doesn't mean that it's not uh, torture or it's not cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. In fact, what happens is many people don't cope. It has profound effects on your psyche, even on the way your brain acts after a certain period. It's very important for the international community to be constantly reminding states that they have obligations under international law and that they have to abide by this, the standards that international law has developed around the matter of the right of every person to physical and, and moral integrity. The system is damaging everyone. The community is not safe. People employed by the system is not safe. The people that work in the prisons, number one, uh, don't reflect the population they serve. Number two, they're also as much suffering as the people who are incarcerated uh, because they're trapped there as well as anyone else. Corrections and law enforcement have been working over two decades. People who've never been in prison think that, you know, going in and being by yourself would, would, would be the ideal situation. You know, I used to believe that before I started working in a prison. I thought, well, I'd want to be locked away from everyone else and, uh, you know, I would have to put up with scary guys. The problem is, is you become the scary guy when, when you're placed in a, a solitary condition. I've seen more staff assaults from inmates that are placed in administrative segregation in solitary conditions, then if you were to leave that individual with proper counseling or medication in, in general population. Unfortunately, most, most correctional departments are based on uh, tradition. We have a tradition of uh, locking people up in uh, administrative segregation, solitary conditions. This goes back all the way to 1829 with the uh, Eastern State Penitentiary. The penitentiary was built all solitary. 
all the cells were solitary cells. You know, the hope was that the person would be able to find their inner peace, their inner spirit. Unfortunately, that's not what, what they found. They found that people decompensated and the system of uh, complete solitary was a failure. It's important that staff are able to recognize that a person is having a problem, that they are having a mental health problem, and to be able to uh, address those needs, to get them uh, proper help. Uh, if they need uh, counseling, uh, if they need a uh, change in medication, uh, make the proper referrals to uh, medical departments. CIT, crisis intervention training, teaches correctional officers how to manage uh, persons with uh, mental disabilities. Teaching correctional staff how to manage the situation is critical to prevent any risk of assault to the correctional staff themselves and any harm to this individual. Currently, it is not in use in Texas. We have a house bill. If that is implemented, it will require a CIT training for all new officers coming into the system. You can be viewed as not being a team player. That's a challenge, you know, we face all the time. Myself, uh, I'll probably never promote through the prison system. And, but that, that's a stigma and that's a price uh, I'm willing to pay. You know, if it's doing the right thing, uh, we need to move forward and uh, modernize our correctional system. I think it's the humanity of people in prison that gets lost. That we still live in a very segregated society in far too many ways, by income, by education, by housing patterns and the like. Uh, when we talk about punishing somebody, if it's somebody who's distant, somebody we don't know, somebody of a different race, ethnicity, it's much easier for people to figure out that, oh, I think punishment is the way to go. When it's someone close to us, then we start to ask questions about why they engage in this behavior and we start to open our minds to different approaches and that's that's really the problem when i was 16 years old i wasn't trying to decide if i should go to band camp karate school or if i should go i don't know like water skiing i was trying to decide how i'm going to duck the police today how i'm going to try to make some money to help my mother feed my other three brothers because she has two mcdonald jobs and even that's not enough you know i'm trying to decide um how I'm going to keep from getting robbed because there's other people that are thinking the same way and might see me as, as prey. You know, these were the decisions that I was faced with. All brothers and sisters that were all made in God's image and likeness, and if we're, we're aware of that, how can we possibly treat one another that way? It's disgraceful and uh, to realize that a perfectly sane person could walk into solitary confinement unit and come out destroyed. Prolonged isolation is wrong. It's against the reason that we were created. It's against human nature. It's against God's plan for us as, as people. We are called to go to the places where people are not looking and have turned away to the darkest places and to remove the barriers for the light to come out of those places. Our prison system is something that we have hidden away. We don't look at it. When we give ourselves permission to treat people so extremely cruelly, we are, are, are deadening a part of ourselves. You know, we're doing damage to our own moral psyche, you know, our own humanity. So the, it can't be stated strongly enough that recognizing the humanity in everyone in prison is crucial, as well as all the people who work there. You know, that, that we are all human beings and we have to find a way to live together. And, and the way to live together is not to live separately, but to figure out really how can we live together and what would it take. Last week, we reported to you that this strike had resumed after earlier in the year when 6,000 protesters across the state refused food, asked for their conditions to be more humane, and especially for the practice of solitary confinement to come to an end. Many prison groups here in California received a packet of information from prisoners at Pelican Bay saying we're going on hunger strike in July and it won't be successful unless you organize on the outside. And a lot of groups came together and formed a coalition, the Prisoner Hunger Strike Solidarity Coalition, which has been meeting ever since, virtually every Monday night, ever since January of 2011. And it's been made up of a lot of, of the prison groups, but also a lot of family members. Because when the prisoners went on hunger strike, 
then. They really kind of came out of the closet to their families. They, they had been protecting their families from knowing how bad the situation was. And so the families have really stepped up. Formerly incarcerated have really stepped up and been a very important part, I would say really the backbone of this coalition. My son wrote a letter and he asked us to mail it to various organizations, to Governor Brown and to Matthew Cates, and he had a list of, I think, like 200 organizations announcing that there would be a hunger strike and that they, the issues that they were looking into at the time. So I did all this, but I kept reading the letters from all the prisoners saying, you know, this was gonna be an indefinite hunger strike, and I became very concerned. I became, um, I thought, they're gonna starve to death They've gone on hunger strike three times in this intervening period, twice in 2011 for 30 days each, and once in 2013 for 60 days. They are promoting their five core demands. These demands are really quite reasonable. They don't even say, shut down the shoe, which we would say. We, we don't think that there's room for this kind of torture to continue in any prison system. And then they began this process of dialogue about what's really going on. And it was nationally covered. And, and the, the kind of exposure we tried to give it all these years that didn't seem to go anywhere was suddenly on the front pages of all papers across the country and, and in different parts of the world. Here we are year after year, decade after decade, as our loved ones sit in solitary confinement, as if we're still trying to figure out, is this detrimental to their physical and mental well-being? We've seen the studies and the research and the suicides. The conditions of the shoe. Okay, look, uh, I, I want to say this in the most professional and uh, the, so the shoe is torture, okay? The shoe is a torture chamber, okay? It doesn't serve. When I walked into the, this, into California's torture chamber, I was the whole human being. And when I left there, I was deeply fractured human being. Okay. Family members are not ashamed anymore to go visit their family members and find out exactly what's going on. They're not afraid to stand up in front of legislators and let the world know, yeah, I have a brother incarcerated. They're not saying my brother didn't do anything wrong. They're saying my brother is incarcerated for something he may have may, may have or may not have done. But he doesn't deserve to be treated like a subhuman being. He is still a human being. And our legislators are starting to hear, our representatives are starting to listen. It was no longer a secret. And when you had hunger strikers up there doing that and their families standing on the steps of city halls and appearing in public forums and going to the newspapers, suddenly, the horror of Pelican Bay was public. I remember f feeling really sick in my, to my stomach, like, thinking that this was being done in my name, in the name of every citizen in the state of California. As a person of faith, that you know, my job is to stand with people who are suffering and to help alleviate and be compassionate and to bring that light into the situation. Even just to stand with someone is a beginning. It's important, I believe, for every person of faith to be involved because of our faith tradition, this is personal for all of us. I have worked to try to get congregations engaged in sending holiday cards with a note from the pastor or the priest along with a personal note. And I was so stunned, actually, at the numbers of long letters that poured in to the congregation, almost immediately expressing how much these notes meant. I always recommend, you know, uh, students and everybody to please get involved and, you know, fight for, for what's right. You've got to somehow let people know what it is that's happening, whether it's through a sermon or through a, a forum or an adult class. Tonight, we will hear the voices of some of the people who have been in the solitary confinement. My name is Sean Swain, Mansfield Correctional Institute, Ohio. All I have is this pen, this paper, and the truth. Writers just handed out the scripts, and one, two, three, four, we numbered off and read them. And the room was just, I mean, we were all sort of paralyzed by the stuff we were reading. It was the kind of power that comes 
when those words come off your own lips about what it is that people experience there. All these people you see in here, a majority of formerly incarcerated people, leading congregations and organizations within their own community all across the state of California. I don't think you can go to a community where they don't understand now what the shoe is, and at least here in California. And I see the movements going on all across the country. It's gonna take a mass movement of the people. There's just so many things that every single person can do in making a difference. The HALT Act is a humane alternative to long-term isolated confinement. It is the most comprehensive bill ever. It is a statewide bill, so it encompasses every county. The core principle behind the HALT Solitary Confinement Act is to say that if somebody is really, truly a threat to other people inside of the prison, then those individuals could be separated without being isolated. And that that separation should be an opportunity for an intervention that is both humane and effective at addressing people's underlying needs and the causes of their behavior. The Halt Solitary Confinement Act would say that no person could be subjected to solitary confinement beyond 15 days in line with what the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture has demanded. When I became aware of the Campaign for Alternatives to Isolated Confinement here in New York, and then I found out that they were also collaborating with NearCat. I got more involved in that work. The more we did, the more I could see the need for more communities of faith in New York State to be involved in this. People who are incarcerated, people who are put in solitary confinement, the vast majority of them are going to come back to our communities. And if we don't treat them humanely and offer them opportunities for rehabilitation, our communities are going to suffer because of that. So I think it's important that each of us does something to address this issue. There's somebody in Albany right now getting paid to say that you want solitary inside that jail, even if you haven't said it out your mouth. You know, so get in, call, get in contact with whoever is in charge of your district and say, I don't want solitary. I'm not going to vote for you if you continue to allow this to happen. When we hear about torture or other inhumane conditions in other parts of the world, we judge the governments who inflict that torture or those inhumane conditions. We need to do the same thing here in New York State. We should not judge the people who are incarcerated. We need to judge the government and the representatives and the officials who are inflicting this inhumane practice. And it's up to us as citizens of this state, as community members in this state, to raise our voices, to put pressure on our legislators to say, not in our name. We have a human rights crisis here in New York State. Over 4,000 individuals, many of the most vulnerable and defenseless amongst us, are subject to state-sanctioned torture in the form of solitary confinement. I feel empowered. Many of our lawmakers think we're doing them a service when we come and talk to them about this particular bill, the Halt Solitary Confinement Act. So if you want people less likely to go back to prison, let's do the things inside prisons that work and eliminate things that don't work. Solitary confinement does not work. Harsh punishment does not work. I think they need to contact their senators and their assembly people, um, because it's in both houses now, and really get that bill passed. If that, when that bill is passed, it would mean the end to solitary confinement as we know it today. And there are so many other ways in which we can deal with uh, people who maybe need to be separated, but not isolated. Um, so that's, that's what I would say, to get on board with that bill. So when we were doing the legislation, we actually was consulting with people currently in solitary, people who have left it, and people who have been there, people who have worked in the correction side. Since then, we have the New Jersey Campaign for Alternative Isolated Confinement. Here on behalf of the ACLU of New Jersey, I'm also here on behalf of a coalition of advocates seeking alternatives to isolated confinement here in New Jersey. Recent studies have shown that isolated or restricted confinement um, have has grave consequences. 
most Americans really just want to do the right thing. And this is the right thing to do, is to reduce the number of men and women to zero that are being punished with solitary confinement and to find asset-based ways to correct behavior in our prison system. Yeah, that's my little girl. She, um, she here she's uh, about 11, 11 years old, and uh, she's sleeping peacefully. And um, this is one of the last pictures I received after, um, right, right before I, I was released in 2013. And it kind of just keeps me motivated, you know. Um, the criminal justice system prison itself um, affects more than just the person who's incarcerated. We're also incarcerating the entire family. And as a result, it also affects the community in which that family lives in. And sometimes we don't get to see the effects until years later. What happened to me in prison should not have happened, but it did. And because of that, I feel like the 18 years that you took from me and they messed me up and left me with the mental illness, I will spend the rest of my days being an advocate for the people that cannot speak. But what has happened to me, I will not allow to happen to anybody. And I, this is how I spend my days, trying to make a difference. I would go to a woman uh, in the Bing, and we would have a conversation through the glass. I would say to her, uh, would you like me to pray over you? And she would say yes. And then she would put her hand against the glass, and I would put my hand against the glass, and that's how we would pray. We need to choose the way of compassion. Even for people who have committed crimes, we need to find different interventions to really transform lives. As the faith community, we need to try to see the divinity in others. The church's role is about changing systems and structures and uprooting systems that marginalized others. We would love for anyone and everyone to come and join this movement. People need to know what goes on behind the walls. You know, part of the reason that the walls are there are not only to keep people in, but to keep the public out. And we need to get the voices out. You know, people who are held in solitary, they're intentionally there for a number of reasons, but one of which is so that they can't be heard. They are thrown in a box and forgotten about and it's up to us to spread the word. We need to educate ourselves. We need to learn about these issues. We need to have our open eyes and hearts turned towards people that are speaking now very loudly in our communities and the communities around us, and we need to hear them. Second, we need to engage in some way, locally, personally, by making phone calls, by speaking out, by writing op-eds, we need to join with other folks and be followers when we need to be followers and find our places of power and acknowledge our places of power and be leaders where we can actually be leaders. And we need to identify those places together. The goal is so that they just see what it is like to be in solitary confinement and hopefully they can have a few minutes to sit here by themselves and think about what it would be like to be here for years. It's going on tour to different congregations. People who have experienced this even for a very brief time, I think it, it, they come out and it's almost as if it takes their breath away. That brief time you, can, you can't even begin to imagine what it is like to spend years and in some cases decades in this experience. So I think having this replica shoe has been a real eye-opener for many, many people. So we're still using the same principles that, as a society, we have said we've stepped above, that morally we're, we're, we're beyond doing, torturing people. This is not for one particular religious organization. This is not for one person's view of a higher power. This is for all humanity to say from a human rights level. We cannot let humans be furtherly damaged by a system that we control. And we have the power to change that.